I got this Dell laptop new in box for free in 2008. I used it for three years until 2011. Is it still usable today in 2017? If you're around my age, a college student in the middle 2000s, you may remember a time when mobile computing options were not wholly viable. What you would get in portability may not have been an adequate trade-off for the loss in performance. Back in 1999, when desktops had Pentium 3 550 MHz processors and 40 GB hard drives, laptops were stuck with Pentium 2 433 MHz and 12 GB hard drives, a significant trade-off if you consider the laptop being under spec by more than 20% but costing 20% more. In some more unfortunate cases, laptops were stuck with the budget Intel brand of Celeron processors, meaning that you had a computer that was near obsolete the moment that you bought it. Laptops benefited from Moore's Law in that mobile versions of desktop processors had similar percentage increases in performance from the previous generation, but there was always a performance decrease in laptops when you gain that portability. Laptops since the year 2012 have been very streamlined. Some have taken a tablet-like appearance, and the trade-off of performance for portability is much more worth it now than back then. But I want to go further back to the day I got this laptop new in box for free in 2008. Today is September 11th, 2010. Um, got hit by a car last Thursday, nine days ago. This Vostro 1000 laptop was the entry-level model in Dell's lineup back then. It featured an AMD Sempron mobile processor, 3600 plus, but ran at two gigahertz. Already back then, the Sempron models of processors were not worth much money and were known to be low budget chips. Budget grade processors really shorten the useful life of your computer. And when added to 512 megabytes of RAM, at a time when one to two gigabytes was close to standard. Integrated onboard graphics and an 80 gigabyte 4800 RPM hard drive. On my hands was a very cheap entry level laptop that was not destined to last more than just a couple years of use. In fact, I received this because I was randomly selected to participate in a survey. And in order to answer the survey questions, they gave me this laptop to ensure that I would be able to. Aesthetically speaking, this laptop was no looker, even by 2008 standards. It was heavy, thick, and its chunky plastic black exterior was nothing that caught anyone's eye. It ran pretty hot most of the time, and fans were moderately loud, but nothing less than you would expect from a laptop of this caliber. At its prime, the battery lasted about two hours of use, which wouldn't last me through class, and it greatly limited its portability. And its small trackpad, which surprisingly isn't too difficult to use, was sufficient along with the decent keyboard. But I remember I connected a mouse and keyboard just to make things a little bit easier. And that brings me to its I.O. Before HDMI connectors were mainstay, there was this VGA port and its supporting cable. These handled 1080 resolutions and were very large connectors. USB here is strictly 2.0, as 3.0 was just beginning to emerge in 2008, but on a budget laptop, you wouldn't have found that new technology on something like this. There was an SD card slot, something that's curiously starting to disappear from today's laptops. Another thing you sacrifice when getting a laptop instead of a desktop is expandability and upgradability. In opening this laptop, you can upgrade the hard drive, you can upgrade the RAM, maybe, but definitely not the processor and not the graphics card. Things haven't changed too much in the last nine years. Gaming was ridiculously limited on this PC even back in 2008. I was lucky to run StarCraft and Doom, games that were 10 and 15 years older than this laptop. But back then, that was the beauty of this computer. As a student, 
I didn't want to spend time getting sucked into games, and just creating a barrier to access was enough to keep me away. Now, in terms of benchmarks, well, let's just say that Windows XP isn't exactly the forefront of technology anymore, so it was hard to find one that works. But the one that did run shows that this computer had 98% of all PCs ever running the benchmark is faster than this one. It's in that second percentile of PCs. I mean, what do you expect from a nine-year-old laptop that was entry-level back in its day? You can barely browse the internet in 2017 with this laptop from 2008. Oh my god. Now the built-in screen for this laptop had a resolution of 1280 by 800 and really by today's standards, the screen actually isn't too bad. If you think about how quickly tech has progressed since 2008, you'd expect all laptops to not merely have just 1080 displays, but 4K displays and batteries to back it up, even on lower end laptops. But not everything is perfect in today's world. And herein lies the problem with tech that has become much worse since this laptop was released. If you're old enough to remember the year 2007, you'll remember the tech revolution that happened starting with the release of the very first iPhone in a touch screen device that could handle calls and had a camera, you inevitably had a piece of technology that generalized so many different uses, but also got the user experience right. And it empowered independent developers to create things for the masses. It took a few iterations to fully develop it, but by the release of the first iPad in 2010, it became clear that the future of consumer computing was mobile that desktops would begin a long and slow decline. And given the recent demise of tablets, I now suspect that the world lives by the notion that smaller is better in technology. While it may be unfair to compare an entry-level laptop from 2008 to this fully specced 15-inch MacBook Pro from 2013, there's five years separating these computers. An entry-level laptop in 2013, I suspect, will be able to browse the internet in 2018, a time span of five years. Whereas this 2008 laptop wasn't able to browse 2013's internet very effectively. In fact, you can't even watch 720p videos on YouTube with this laptop. These tech ads from 1999 are ridiculous. How do they compare to 2017's ads? And back in 2013, 1080p was already the standard, and 4K was just beginning to emerge. But now look at this. An entry-level laptop from 2008 has a screen not much inferior to many laptops out today, as well as has an SD card reader, something that's curiously missing from some of the most expensive laptops out today, nine years later. It was laughable when a laptop released in 2015 had a 480p front-facing camera, and it should still be laughable today. It certainly isn't a question of whether these companies can put a better camera on the laptop or a better screen on the laptop. They certainly can. However, they keep the standard low and then charge you more for that extra feature or give themselves room for the next iteration for the following year. Despite tech progressing quickly still, they will want to charge you for the extras and the add-ons, much like how they are charging you to get an SD card reader on a laptop whose previous generation had one. One day, they may charge you to unlock a hard drive interface on your computer, or charge you for a software upgrade to install regular applications that you would use every day. These things are starting to happen now in 2017, and should they develop even more, we all lose. You see, computer shipments, including desktops and laptops, have fallen over the last few years. But it makes sense, because computers can last much longer now. Upgrades are incremental, and there simply is no reason to sink thousands of dollars into the next immediate generation, because you likely won't get thousands of dollars of value from it. In the face of declining demand of new computers, it's likely that these companies are looking for a way to sustain themselves now through more aggressive product development, and attempt to grow their revenues to please shareholders. 
There's nothing wrong with that except we as regular people and consumers lose out and we're gonna have to pay more to get the same value that we used to get. You see, the industry that I come from in medicine is one of the most regulated professions out there, meaning that there's a wide web of rules one must follow to work or even be qualified to work, and this greatly limits the regular person's ability to contribute to something as important as their own healthcare. I see technology and personal computing as a free profession. From open source software development to universal standards like USB ports and display port, things that work across billions of devices throughout. These are things that don't exist in healthcare and medicine. In the United States, even getting companies to agree on a standard file format for your electronic health data has become a problem and nobody's agreeing on a standard format. And it's happening today in 2017. In an open environment like technology, people are more free to express themselves and bring forth new ideas. It gives a chance for the little guys to one day take down the big guys. It happened back in the 1980s to IBM when Apple came about. It happened to Microsoft in the 2000s when Google came about. It happened to desktop PCs in 2007 when smartphones and tablets came about. And I hope it happens again with today's computing paradigm. But today, I see the tech industry consolidating. I see some very clear winners holding on to their number one title in the face of declining demand. I see a maturing market. And that's problematic for us regular folks because it leaves us wide open for anti-consumer abuses, like paying extra for what was functionally available way back when. I'm not sure I like where computing is going right now now that upgrades are slow and incremental. There's no new paradigms that are on the horizon, and it's more possible today than ever that we will eventually say 2008. Those were the golden days. Thanks so much for watching this weekend. Have a great week, and I'll see you next weekend. Adios, amigos.